thank you very much for making the time to come to this meeting. It's, uh, it's an important meeting on an important issue. Um, Council, I'm Ryan O'Donnell uh, from Ward 3, I think I know everyone. Uh, and Ward 4 City Council, Jim Lee Sharon is here. Uh, put this together. Uh, our Council President, Bill Dwight, is here. A man who needs no introduction or doesn't want one. So <laughs> <laughs> got one anyway. Yeah, <laughs> and Council Marion Clark from Ward 6. And Director Wayne Fyden from the Office of Planning and Sustainability is here. And thank, thank you to everyone who helped. Um, put this forum together. So we're here, if you're here, you know, we're, we're here to talk about zoning. And zoning zoning matters. Um, it matters in particular to certain parts of the city at this point, but really it matters to the entire city. And not only that, it matters really in a way that will, in a lasting way. It's not like the budget where you do it every year. We're changing our zoning rules right now in a way that will impact for decades. And I think there's going to be a couple areas of conversation. The first is forward-looking. Um, as you probably know, last year when the City Council was debating uh, the zoning reform package, it put in place a moratorium on the development of, uh, of, of large developments, of, of seven units or more. That moratorium is expiring uh, as of July 1st. And so something is going to take the place of that. And one of our immediate jobs is to figure out what is going to take the place of that. The planning board issued some recommendations that will go to the ordinance committee, the hearing of the ordinance committee, a week from today um, at 5 o'clock in the council chamber. And after that, if the Ordinance Committee passes it out, they'll go to the full City Council for consideration over the coming months. So that's, that's the process for this. Um, that's important. I think many of you were here for another forum we did on the future of, of Fort Hill, uh, the Fort Hill Lyman Estate. Councilor Sheriff's here for that too, and others are here for that. Um, Big developments like that, or potential developments, another one is Shaw's Motel in, in, in Ward 3, will be profoundly affected by the rules that govern large developments. The other area, which I know many people have contacted me about, um, is the zoning package that, that was passed. And there are some concerns about what was passed last year. Both things, this is, this is, my, this is my framing of this meeting, both things are completely on the table for discussion. Um, but my hope is that we can try to figure out a creative and positive solution about not just what we don't want, but what we do want. Um, the purpose of this forum is to get everyone's opinion on the table, um, and so you can hear the opinions of, of your neighbors and people that you know and respect as well as your own. And I, I really hope that we can decide on something that we, we can we can be for something at the end of this at the end of this whole process. We should be able to find a zoning. Um, a series of zoning laws that we are in favor of and that we think are positive for the city of New York. So we're not going to we're not going to do that today. We're not going to solve the zoning problem today. But I'm here, and the other councilors are here, uh, and the office, office of planning is here to listen to these concerns as a first step. And like I say, we'll then go to the ordinance committee here in a week from today. And what I'd like to do before we get into questions. Um, is first ask if, if Councilor, if you want to say anything in addition to that. Uh, no, I think I think Ryan framed it beautifully. Um, I agree that that I mean I think we all have desires of how we'd like this to look, but um, hopefully we can have a really positive discussion and decide what we'd like to see the future of this kind of technology. Thanks everyone. So and what I'd like to do is is turn it over to Director Fighting who, among other things, can explain what the planning board has, has recommended for uh, the rule of seven, seven more units. And after that explanation, then I hope we can, then I'll launch into a, a, a question and answer thing and we can have a discussion. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Wayne. Thank you. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time to start talking about how we got here, but I guess it's important in terms of going forward. This process has been going on really for over nine years. Um, the city went through a process of adopting 
scale and key information of comprehensive plan. It's our sort of big picture vision. Our last comprehensive plan was done in 1974, and so by 2008, that plan was sort of dramatically out of date. And so it's sort of literally a four-year process to adopt the plan. We have lots of community meetings, lots of discussions. Um, zoning the downtown, neighbors around downtown is just one of dozens of issues that was discussed. But it set in place sort of this, I think, this overall vision for um, trying to encourage two things, I think. One is trying to encourage a, a greater percentage of housing starts to be within walking distance of downtown and our goals. So um, and second is trying to keep the population in those areas from shrinking further. So we've had 20 years where the population within walking distance of the urban areas keeps dropping. Um, and this is mostly driven because we have fewer people per dwelling unit than people per home. Um, and so we need to get more dwelling units just to keep the population the same. So this is about huge increase in the population. It's about sort of We want to go through and come back afterwards. Um, so we went through this process. The first process was we had an outside team of people came into the community who was called a sustainable design assessment, sort of to challenge the community and say what works and what doesn't work, how can we do better? That was then the genesis for the state of Wisconsin plan. Um, and then after the plan was adopted, city council and planning board formed this zone revisions committee that sort of began looking at the plan, creating sort of recommendations for going forward on it. On it. Um, again, that some more public meetings. Then went to the planning board who further altered those things, and then lots more public hearings as the zoning process went through. Um, and so the first set of zoning changes was were adopted last in September. Um, and they did two basic things that I want to talk about. One is they uh, changed some of the dimensional density standards to allow, basically to allow development in the urban areas, the urban walking distances of villages and, and town centers to match the historical patterns. Um, and then the second is they talked about what bigger projects would be like. And what city council did in an effort to, to find a compromise, a consensus, last August is they approved all the dimensional density changes. And then, uh, as Ryan said, they put a moratorium on projects, seven or more units, and said, instead of just approving these projects, we want to create a process. We want to create a set of rules by which we know when those projects get approved. And so the zoning change before council now is really about what should the rules be. If I come in tomorrow and want to do a seven-unit project, I want to do a 700 unit project. What are the rules by which the planning board would look at that project? Um, and so these are sort of the steps, I'm not going to go through all these, but um, city council, you know, put this moratorium in effect, you know, approved the zone, put the moratorium in effect. We've been having discussions. The Fort Hill meeting was primarily about Fort Hill, um, but it was also sort of a test. We sort of looked at, in terms of ways of testing the zone, we've been thinking, how would New Zone apply for a very large parcel of land, of which Fort Hill is really the only one that exists? How would it apply for a fairly small parcel of land that's sort of a totally raw site, of which you can think about Shaw's Motel, and then how would it apply for other areas? So as part of this process, we've sort of been testing the rules and saying, does it work in these different circumstances? Um, and so that's the zoning that this going through the process now. Just again, in terms of background, when we did scale on a campaign plan, one of the first things we did is we asked someone to go around and take pictures of lots of neighborhoods and look at the density of the neighborhoods. Um, and you can't really see it on here, but these, these are pictures of the urban areas. We did this for suburban areas as well. These were eight units per acre and 54 units per acre. And what's, what was interesting is certainly at 30 units per acre or 50 units per acre, you know, the density really stands out. People get that. These are the big apartments. But within that, that mid-range of density, what we found is the relationship between density and the value of the neighborhood, there wasn't any relationship. So the most expensive neighborhoods in town, some neighborhoods that we all say we absolutely adore, are really dense neighborhoods. Um, and some of the neighborhoods that people don't like. You know, so they're, they're, sort of, they're all across the board for doing it. And it was part of what informed the conversation, I think, in Sustainable and Hampton, that it may be less about the number of units per se and more, or less, more about how the units operate. You know, what, what's the function of these units? Are the units big or small? Are the traffic issues? Um, and so that's why we try to think about some of the issues. 
Um, so I'm not going to, again, go through all these numbers, but this is sort of you know, the trend we've been seeing since 1980. The city's population has been dropping steadily, not dramatically, but steadily, um, and it's been dropping more significantly in the urban areas than the outlying. Again, this isn't because people are fleeing these areas. This is because when I was a kid, there were five people living in my family, and now if I go to a typical family with kids, there's fewer people, live longer, you know, so just the average family size has dropped dramatically, and so it takes a lot more housing units to get to the family size. And we've had fewer units in the last 30 years built in walking distance of downtown than we've had in the outlying areas. So that's why we've been losing population in those areas. Um, and so, one of the big discussions is, and I'm just going to focus on downtown, you can have the same discussion about Florence and, and other areas of town. But one discussion is, where are the places that's most important to make sure we accommodate people is the area where people can walk. Um, and so these are two rings. Um, this is this map. This is Central Business District. This is a quarter mile from Central Business District for Brown. This is half mile from Central Business District for Brown. And so those are the areas which you'd expect most of the trips to be on foot. Um, not all the trips by any means, certainly different kinds of trips. You know, some, I, I live a mile from downtown and I walk most often. But you still, you, you'd expect a lot of trips in this area to be on foot. Um, and so to some extent, the denser zoning is aligned, to a large extent, is aligned with those areas. Um, that quarter of a mile from downtown, 100% of that is URC, or almost 100% of that is URC, which is a densely residential district. Um, so the zoning that, that Brian was talking about, we've looked at is all these things in, in our color of this map. Um, again, I'm just focusing on downtown for this meeting, folks in Ward 3 and 4. But these are the areas we've sort of been looking at generally in terms of the zoning change that City Council passed before. And the goals going into that discussion with City Council, the final vote, which was last September, were how do we meet these different things? How do we, in essence, legalize our neighborhoods? Um, if, our, if some of the neighborhoods had magically disappeared before September, these neighborhoods we all say we love, um, the zone wouldn't have allowed a lot of them to be rebuilt. Um, and so a lot of us are saying, you know, we like these neighborhoods, how do we permit them, both the existing pattern is there and allowing that pattern to be replicated. Um, the rest of the thing going over already, but you know, thinking about flexibility for new units, thinking about flexibility for changing lifestyles, um, you know, different needs, different kinds of populations. Uh, affordable housing, you know, it, it, we always hear this, that units obviously create traffic, and so if a new unit is in the neighborhood, it's going to create traffic. And if we look at if the new unit is in within walking distance downtown versus not walking distance, the overall fact of units in walking distance is going to create less traffic. So those are sort of the background going That's the That's a little bit conclusion, all right, because people may live within a quarter mile, but they will still purchase an automobile. Well, we, I come back to questions later. The, the, the quick number is ITE. I'm pointing out okay. that some of your assumptions are fallacious. Okay. Yeah, yeah, what, what, is this, what is the data that you base Let on? Let me go through it and I'm happy to share because I took the questions. So the objectives we're trying to get is um, allowing a modest number of new units, allowing the, the legalizing of existing units, um, and allowing sort of this flexibility in kinds of units to have. So we've heard developers tell us, for example, that under the old zoning, they had to build larger housing units. Because if the zoning says you can do X units per acre, um, and you want to maximize your return, then you need to do a big housing unit. Um, if the zoning allows more units per acre, it allows developers to have some smaller housing units as well. So it's that kind of thing in terms of thinking about the flexibility of housing types. Um, so in terms of numbers, you know, and again, I won't go through this because the zones that passed before, but we looked at these three neighborhoods, URA, which is the outermost ring um, of dense residential areas, so it's the sort of Florence parts of Ward 1, URB, which is the ring around Florence, and the second ring around downtown, and URC, which is the immediate ring around downtown. Um, so in URA, um, the numbers we found before was that only 65% of the units were legal in terms of zoning. That is, we say we like URA, and yet 35% of units didn't comply. Um, and so the zoning was really changing in part to say, there's a language pattern that we like, how do we legalize some more of it? Similar analysis for URB. So for example, for single family homes, under the old rules, only 63% of the homes 
conform to zoning under the new rule of 99% of single family homes conform to zoning. So we're saying, hey, if this works as a successful neighborhood, isn't that a pattern we want to reinforce? Um, and then you are seeing the same sort of thing. Single family homes, only 61% comply. Now 90% of, of single family homes comply. Um, we still have homes that are far, far denser. So if you look at um, three families, for example, even under today's standards, less than half those units need to come. So we have lots of three families out there that are still in smaller lots than we're permitted for the three new house. At least we you know, allow more of them to be legal. So that's the background that brought us here. One of the things we heard a lot in discussion was not just about the number of units, it's about how do they look. So <coughs> planning board suggested the city council approved for the first time some design standards. Now, there was a lot of debate about this, how far to go with design standards. You know, we have much stricter design standards on Elm Street and the downtown. One could have stricter design standards for residential neighborhoods. This is sort of where this seemed to be the, the sweet spot of the greatest amount of consensus. Um, and so we focused on things like how do you do buildings where a garage doesn't dominate? This is where sort of the California home, where what you see is the garage. Um, and so these are all different efforts to how to make a garage smaller. Garage can be further back, garage can be smaller percentage of front floor side, garage can be hidden, lots of different ways, but not a house which is dominated by a garage. Um, why same goes for parking. Um, you know, how do we think about parking along the driveways so that maybe you have as few cars as possible? You don't have a parking lot that's in view from the street. You have some cars parked along the driveway, you have a parking lot behind the building, but again, parking doesn't dominate. Um, and then finally, how do we think about scale and character of a neighborhood? So you can sort of look, look at these things, and one may stand out, and I mean, not always fit. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean if you have a single family home, you can't put up an observatory. It doesn't mean that all heights have to be the same, but it means we have to think about the heights and how these things fit together, and, and what's the story that makes this So those were all the things which, which State Council approved already. Um, the new zoning changes, as Ryan said, the moratorium ends on July 1st, and so the question is, what are the, what, what are the standards that go on that? And the way the rules are right now is any project that's, other, other than a single family home, any project that's 2,000 square feet or more, so two family home and anything larger, that's 2,000 feet or more needs a site plan approval from the planning board. In a site plan approval, the planning board does not turn down the project, it's not about the number of units, but they look at how does the site operate? How do we make sure that all these sort of rules are followed? How do we make sure the landscape is correct, the sound works, the traffic mitigation works? Um, for projects that are seven or more units, that requires a, a, a special permit from the planning board. The planning board has more discretion for those projects to say yes or no. Um, if we did nothing between now and July 1st, what would happen is a developer could come for a project with seven or more units, but both the developer will be afraid because they don't know what the standards are for the planning board, and the neighbors will be afraid because they don't know what the standards are for the planning board. So the assignment, if you will, the planning board had is to create standards that we can look at as some predictability and some guidance for both the neighborhood and the And so we generally looked at these areas, streetscape design, et cetera, et cetera. I thought it was going to revert to subdivision regs. No, that's something separate. Um, and that's not so much being affected by this. So That's for 10 or more? It's being proposed to change to, to 7 as well. Um, so let me come back to that. Okay, just um, yeah. So then, and then I, we're not here yet, but just so you know, the next phase we hadn't gotten to is looking at maps. So far, all the changes we made were changing the rules for zoning districts, not changing the boundaries. Um, I think there's some consensus that URA doesn't necessarily make sense in terms of what boundaries are. It's the next thing the planning board's, you know, to-do list is to work on. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to go through the proposed standards. You have the legalistic document in front of you, but I'm just going to go through and try to put this in, in plain English on what's proposed zoning to do. Um, so the first is, again, the Zoning September created the first streetscape design standards in these neighborhoods. That, that was a slide I showed you. This zoning is attempting to go a little bit further and create more standards. Because these projects require special permits, we don't need to have exactly a black and white standard. We need to have a set of criteria 
at which the planning board judges a project um, to give guidance again to developers and to neighborhoods of what's expected. So the basic point of this is we want buildings to be friendly to the street. We don't want the rear end of buildings facing the street and the front of the building facing the parking lot beyond. We want the buildings to be be on the street, to have their life on the street, um, not to have a parking lot there. And so that's sort of the point of view. The second thing, and this is particularly important for a larger project like Fort Hill, but it certainly applies to other projects as well, is just think about all the ways the project connects to the area. So where there's not a roadway, for example, or a driveway, there should be bike path connections, bicycle connections, and pedestrian connections to the extent possible. And you, know, you get this is, you know, think about Fort Hill, big piece of property, it's important how it connects. But even think about a project like Shaw's Motel. You can imagine a developer who would do a driveway off Pomeroy Terrace and now the only way to get into some units. Um, when really some of the units should have doors on Bridge Street, and if I live in a back unit, I should have walked downtown without walking away from downtown to get there. So connectivity is a big scale, a small scale. Um, it becomes really important for these projects. Um, and so some little details fit this as well. You know, is a so is a piece of asphalt that goes to the property, is that just designed for cars, or is that designed to extend the, the street life into a project? And part of this is saying everything we're talking about should really be a lot. So whether it's a driveway serving a project or how you face the street, it should all be, you know, a vibrant street scale. Um, and so you know, if you think about Fort Hill is the most obvious, we think about the different connections that are out here, maybe the same applies for small projects. Um, some of you were at the earlier meeting, saw some of the slides already, but just think about for Fort Hill, what are the different ways it connects? Um, this is an obvious <coughs> site, but you know, if you're doing a housing project right here, we want you to get you know, lots of different directions. So then the, the third is we want to, and this is already a standard we have, we're just tightening up a little bit. Um, we already say we want to separate pedestrians and bicyclists to the extent possible on any project that's typically done by sidewalks, but not always. And so we're trying to create a design standard. Um, and the design standard currently is if you design the road so the traffic's really below 15 miles an hour, um, you're really controlling the speed of traffic it's safe for bicyclists and pedestrians and cars to share the street. Um, if speed's getting above that, then there should be some separation. The fourth standard, again, this would depend on whether it's a project of seven units or a project of 17 units, but thinking about a central point, a park or a civic space. Now, you can imagine at Fort Hill, a park really might be that. It might be what we traditionally think of as a park. If I'm doing a seven unit project, the civic space may literally be a bench that the front door is face. So you know, this has to be scalable, um, but all projects should still have this, this focal point um, that serves. So if I'm in my seven unit project, I can still hang out and have coffee and have a sense of life. Um, and then, you know, again, a Fort Hill example, but you know, this is some sketch for that meeting, but sort of what are different ways we can imagine parks to, um, again, and what the site is, but thinking about what are the focal points, what are the opportunities in the site. Um, and then one of the concerns we heard early on, particularly in Ward 3, was there's a lot of focus on buildings facing the street, but in small, narrow lots, a lot of the buildings are facing the residential neighborhoods. So one of the discussions is don't just have the interesting part of the building face the street, if you're up against residential properties, think about articulation of windows and doors and how the building faces its neighbors as well. Um, and then more specifically, the facade of the building itself. You know, before I was talking about the streetscape, this is now the building itself. The building should be friendly to the street. It should be adding to the character of the neighborhood instead of taking away from the neighborhood. Um, and again, you know, before Hill, we just we played with really cutting out existing homes um, there and, and how are those homes replicate for it, you know. But just think about how to, you know, what's the, what do I see when I'm walking down the street or walking down the driveway and, and how does that look? Um, and then this is what Jim was asking about. So currently the zoning says if you do a project that's 10 or more units, the infrastructure needs to be designed uh, to meet our subdivision regulations. So subdivisions think of as a suburban concept. 
have a big chunk of land, I'm dividing the land up, what are the roads look like? We don't generally think of subdivisions in our urban neighborhoods. Um, but the subdivision standards also do useful things in terms of, you know, when our sidewalks concrete, when are they asphalt, and what are they made of if they don't fall apart in five years. Um, and so all this is saying is, let's just, because we had a special permit criteria of seven units, let's use the subdivision standards for the same criteria. Just so we're looking at these projects, so we know a driveway is a driveway, you know, you know, a sidewalk is a sidewalk. Um, and then one of the things that came out we heard most strongly for the Port Hill meeting, but other places as well, is think about ways to add some green element to the units. But we also heard how do we how can we be flexible with different developers? So the proposal is to say this is in essence a pick list. Do one of the five things above. So the first is how do we have buildings that are very energy efficient? Um, we're proposing a hers rating system of 45. We're talking going to 40 for this. But what this is is Think about a building that was built under the building code that Hadley still has and that we had three years ago. Um, and a HERS rating of 45 would say we should be using 45% of the energy of what the building would do, you know, the middle man you do for a building code. So it's a stricter building. And we already have a stricter building code. So right now buildings basically can't be designed with a HERS rating less than 60. And most of our buildings are coming on an average of 50. But the idea is saying, how do we get stricter? So that's one approach. The second approach is to say, it should be lead certified goal to some call it a neighborhood, a neighborhood development or new construction. Basically, it's a rating system. It looks at energy at one of the criteria, but it also looks at a lot of other environmental standards. So it may be less strict about energy than hers, but more strict about other things. Um, the third one is requiring a certain percent of the units to be affordable, 15% is what's proposed. And the last one, which we heard very strongly at the Fort Hill meeting, is that 50% of the units be small, 1,200 square feet. This is the so-called market rate affordable. So if affordable units are affordable people earning below 80% of the area, area median income, sort of the standard of, you know, of moderate income. Smaller units just limit the thought cost of the unit with no deed restrictions. Just that we want small units. And then the last one, which probably people use most often, is it may be some combination. But, you know, so that the, the developer was just announced for developing the next stage of the hospital, they do all net zero energy costs. So if that kind of developer is doing it here, then they would probably do the hers rating system. But it, it gives flexibility for this green approach. Um, and then the last one, probably less important to you all, is just how we deal with phasing. Um, it's incredibly expensive to design an entire project, but we want to have a standard. We, do, we want to know what the entire project is so it all makes sense. We don't want someone to spend $20,000 in engineering, um, only to be turned down later in the project. So, you know, figure out how does this work. Right? Um, and then that's that. So, uh, questions over there? Yeah, we, we should open up. And, and just to reiterate, those last nine proposals are, are essentially what is going to be before the council. So, your assumption that if somebody lives within a quarter mile, there will simply be one downtown is that a problem. That's related to what you live on. I live on Post Place, all right, and essentially from November through February, the street becomes impassable because first and foremost, um, during the day, all of the all the people who work downtown. Mm -hmm park on both sides of the street. That street is also the detour for trucks that can't get under the bridge. And at least once a week, the police had to come out because the truck could not get through because there were too many cars. Then at night, the same thing happens the other way because all the residents come in and the street gets filled up. In the winter, there is a major issue. Now, this infill thing, what you're doing is by creating more units, you are automatically importing more cars because in 21st century America, every individual has a car. My household right now, two people, we have two cars. All right, the house next door to us, which is a three-story Victorian can cut up into apartments, every apartment has at least one car. All right, and so the notion that you increase the density 
it's not going to have an impact on traffic. I don't, first of all, I don't see what you base that on because the more people move in, they will be moving in with more cars and there already is a problem. All right? Again, you know, have a semi trying to get through. It's a wonder that cars didn't get wiped out because it can barely make it through as it is. All right? You're <coughs> really In fact, when you're talking about you're trying to restore historic patterns, well, Ward 3, and I'll speak specifically to Phillips Place, is one of the oldest sections of the, of the city. My house was built in 1820, part of it. And the rest of the streets, you know, the, it was a, a plot plan that was registered in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds in 1820. All right. Now with this change in the zoning, you're now talking about taking one of the historic sections of the city, and now additional units are going to be plashed in, breaking the historic pattern of the neighborhood. And I can assume the same thing for the rest of Ward 3. All right. And so, you know, this notion that people just move in, oh, they're just going to walk downtown. Well, that doesn't happen. I mean, like, they may walk downtown. I walk downtown oftentimes. But I still have two cars in our household. And when my daughters come to visit, you know, there are three or four cars. All right, where do all these cars go? This standards, the, at least the zoning change that happened, <coughs> makes no requirement for making accommodations for all of these additional cars. And I'm also deeply troubled. From my perspective, I want this change repealed. It went through in September. I didn't know about it until it passed. All right, I've been living in Phillips Place since 1986. All right, and it has a tremendous impact. Now again, we go to Ward 3. You talk about Shaw's Motel, yes. I fully expect all of those to be raised and some huge projects to be built. That's fair. It was a motel, it's going to be replaced by multi-unit housing. That should meet your goal of having additional units in the area. But I'm looking at, again in Ward 3, the, uh, the church is now vacant, uh, the St. Joseph Cantius Church, and the the uh, archdiocese is obviously <coughs> trying to sell it. They have a big for sale sign all over the property. Eventually, that's going to get demolished. And this is going to be the two buildings there, too, because they have that's a right. fair center. Exactly. The church has a parking so lot. So now we're going to have a huge complex at the corner of Pomeroy and Bridge Street. We're going to have another huge complex, eventually, at the corner of Holly and Forest Place. And in the meantime, across the street from me, uh, again, this is a house that dates back to like 1848. Uh, somebody bought it, and they're going to put in another whole complex on top of half the lot. All right, and where are all these cars going to go to? So, from my perspective, I don't see this. Well, we also have the um, Coolidge condos. We have City View. We have Shaw's Motel. We have Bixby Court. We have the School Commons. We have the Polish Church, and we have the Cutchin Center in addition to one street, Phillips Place, being a downtown parking lot and a truck route. Um, at one end of it, we have SROs on both ends of the street, we have a soup kitchen, and we, also have a, and we also have a warming station at the end of the street. So during the winter time, um, the police affectionately call the street now the thoroughfare. And when we, the residents, call for assistance, be it the fire department or the police department, I'm often met with, oh, I'm sorry, that's the thoroughfare for things like tire slashings and house break-ins and potential arson. And so we really have trouble imagining what your definition of density is under the circumstances. Um, and I'd like to add also that I have a lot of trouble with the fact that I don't feel that Ward 3 was represented um, by the esteemed counselors who made this decision on our behalf. So you said a lot of things, I'm probably not going to remember them all, but we have to start on um, going through this. Um, first is I certainly wouldn't claim that new housing don't generate traffic. What I would say is new housing, there's a lot of studies on new housing units in urban areas definitely create less traffic than that same amount of density further out. So we know that people who live in the walking distance of downtown, who's North Hampton's downtown and elsewhere, have, small, have lower car ownership rates. It's certainly often on cars but they have lower car ownership rates than people who live in you know, the largest border or other areas. And so we look at total trips being generated, there's fewer trips than those areas. What is it? My turn. What is it you refer to? What data are you looking at? Sure, there's lots of data out there. So, uh, Institute of Traffic Engineers, for example, 
has done lots of studies of traffic. So it's the standard piece that most engineers will use. Single family home generates about 10 one way trips per day. When you get into urban areas, the numbers drop. Now, does it drop to zero? Absolutely not. You're still somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or eight units, but that's still a 20 or 30 percent drop. Second, dealer your car ownership rate, the rate of when people, young people get cars and the number of cars they get has dropped. You know, in Northampton, clearly this is part of the reason for zip car success, um, is that there are a lot of people who used to have cars who don't in, in, in big cities. In Northampton, communities our size, we see a slightly different piece, which is people are less likely to have zero car households, or so some of those, but they're more likely to give up their second car or their third car. Um, and so when we look at the total amount of traffic, it, it, and the other thing is people who live in downtown areas tend to drive short distances. So even when they own cars, they tend to drive short distances. Um, and so, and then there's lots of studies that can take emails to one of those things. Okay, can I jump in? Yeah. I, I think there's only, there's probably only so much we should, time we should spend talking about theories of car use. I mean, I, I, think, I think we all agree that people have cars in Western Massachusetts, and if you build more houses, you'll have some more cars. I think our challenge is, um, you know, provisions for parking and, and that kind of thing. Um, you mentioned some streets like Bixby Port. You mentioned uh, City View. Those are exactly the kind of larger developments that we have an opportunity to, uh, to influence with the new zoning. Um, uh, what's now the more touring is ending. So these are the kind of things we can we can ask and, and figure out. So there will be more cars, but we can decide how to deal with them. I'd also say that Phillips Place has special challenges, and, and you mentioned some of them. Trucks, uh, people park there when they want to park downtown. And those are really important, but they're separate from the question of, of zoning. And also, again, there, there are two different things. There's, there's large developments and small developments. And the, the lot that may be built um, on Phillips Place itself is not a giant city lot. It would be a two or three family. So it's important, I think, to make, in order to talk about this constructively, I think we have to draw those distinctions. Joel? Yeah, I, I would just make a very specific answer. Um, let's say we're putting three units up or four units. What do you do about parking? Is there some kind of rule that there has to be uh, off-street parking or some kind of parking so that there's not a parking problem. I mean, there's going to be more traffic, but having come from cities and everything else, the <coughs> traffic issue, other than the big trucks, is, is not an issue for me. But the, but the question becomes, where do people park? Yeah. So it's not the central business district, but in the residential districts, there's a requirement for creating parking spots that serves the project. But that exact formula is either the, the lesser of two units per dwelling or I believe it's one unit per thousand square feet. Um, so I can't remember, really, maybe slide off the number. But the idea is if you're building a thousand square foot apartment, you have to build a parking spot. If you're building a two thousand square foot apartment, you have to build a two parking spot. But in URC, there is no requirement for off street parking when you put up a three family house? No, there is a requirement. So in central business district, there's not. The central business is, in essence, we've privatized parking. We want to have, you know, the problem with private parking in downtown. Is Coach Place is central business district, or is it your, or is it your city? It's your city. Okay. So yes. is there a requirement in URC for off street parking? Yes, there is. So what is, what's the requirement in URC? Again, right. I can't remember the number. It's one per thousand square feet, I believe. Okay. Yeah, there is off street parking. parking. He's correct in this. Okay. Or another name is an architect who's worked with this stuff all the time, and it is a thousand square feet having space. So when something's built on Phillips, there's going to be a driveway. Right. Now, again, lots of these existing units don't have anywhere close to enough parking, but they're grandfathered in. But if I'm building a new unit, the new unit you see. That's on an existing piece of property, for instance, the one built. So Correct. They build the new unit. And then my other question would be, so that's per thousand feet. Is it possible for them to put two units in the per thousand feet? So it's not a, a parking spot per unit. It's per thousand feet, you're saying. That's correct. Right. It's pretty small. I mean, right, in right. urban areas, they play with 350 square foot apartments, right. but around here, right. 800 or 900,000 small. Right. Right. <coughs> Did resident only parking zones get anywhere? I understood some years ago near Smith College. 
We have one on Kensington Estates, a Kensington Avenue, whatever it's called. Um, that's the only one. So it, we went to the state legislature, got authority for doing it. City Council approved the Enabling Act. Um, and so now City Council can create more streets. There's only been one so far. We have a um, uh, uh, parking subcommittee of the Transportation Commission, and that's one of the things they're looking at is, you know, how does this work? Are there other places that make sense to be um, residents only parking? It's not as easy as it sounds in large part because residents are often divided. Like, you know, Graves Ave has had a discussion on the residents. Some people on Graves Avenue desperately want residents only parking. Some don't want to bother, so does that consent? <coughs> but legally, council can't adopt more streets. I think it's the only kind of parking I'm aware of um, where there's an ordinance governing the process for granting it that was written I don't know, 10 years ago or something. Because you, know, you want it to be a fair process. Yeah, I, I have a few observations as to what's going on here. Um, I was, to start off, I was at the Lyman Road presentation about a month and a half ago. And I came to the meeting expecting everything to be laid out for me. Um, you know, the, what the zoning was for this property, what the impacts were, what the possible densities, and, and what could happen on that property was going to be explained. I left here thinking that that was a URB property. The URC regs were not in the room. That the, the residents were presented with, a, with their URB neighborhood superimposed on the, the, the Lyman estate. Um, it's only, you know, until a few days later, I'm like, huh, let me look, hold it, it's URC. And that, you know, I'm looking around the room here and I don't see anybody from Ward 4 to talk about Lyman Road. And it's because they're seeing their neighborhood superimposed on that property. And the reality is that that property is, how many acres is the total property one? Is it, I, I, I think it's, uh, the whole thing is upwards of like 20, 25 acres, which means if you do 17 units per acre, that we're talking 150 to 250 units. And that a nursing home can go in there. And that, you know, a retirement community can go in there. And, you know, I'm not entirely opposed to a, a nice retirement community, but whoever buys that is not going to build that. They're, they're coming in and they're thinking, I'm going to, understandably, bang for the buck. And so, Ward 4 is not here because of that. Um, other things I'd like to share is that you, you do see a lot of residents here um, who are concerned about what's going on in 51 Phillips Place because it's news to them. The reason it's news to them is that during the, the process of uh, uh, going through the rezoning, uh, residents ask for, could you ex show us where these rezonings are going to be? Um, we were provided with a document called ABC um, Changes um, that Ward uh, in, in URC, that, that document identified only 33 properties. Lyman Road was not on there. 51 Phillips wasn't on there. My property's not on there. Matt's property's not on there. Henry Street properties aren't on there. That the gross un underestimation of the impacts of all of these things. We know we can we can go talk to this architect over here and we can subdivide these properties and there's impacts. And that um, what what's going on is you know I feel for Ryan. Ryan's getting calls from constituents saying, what is going on? I didn't know that this was happening. And residents have reason to feel that way because we, we, we did the work on what's A and B and C going to look like, but we never did the total and said, everybody, this is what it's going to be. And so when it happens, 51 Phillips, they're showing up right now. When whoever buys that, they're going to be calling Gina Louise. And, you know, and 
We're going to keep repeating this because people didn't understand the impacts. Now, had we right from the beginning said, here's a map, here's what it means, and you know, we could say, sorry you didn't show up. But the thing is, that ABC changes thing, that's what was shared out at JFK when we had 100 people, 150 people in the room. That's what was shared to city council. And so, you know, we're just going to keep repeating this. And I, I, I really don't want to be sitting through any more zoning meetings. You know? And I, I, my request is that, and, and I said this in a, um, a letter to the editor last year, we need to have this really thoroughly laid out. And I, I, you know, and I've asked the planning department over and over for these figures. So it's clear, so that we don't have what's going on in this room. And um, so, so let me correct a couple of things, because I, I think you've heard this before, we've raised this before, of why we got support isn't quite as easy as it was saying. So you used the example from the first things you said was talking about nursing homes. Um, you know, nursing homes are allowed anywhere in town, any residential district. We have one going on on Haydenville Road in one of the least urban areas. Um, and so these changes would make actually no difference to nursing homes. And in fact, if you think nursing homes are likely to be here, this would probably be a dramatic decrease in density for what's left. That's not um, what he said. He didn't say that he would object. He said that that's not going to happen. And nursing homes are going to happen. Instead, it's going to be somebody getting maximum bang for the buck and taking the formula of, of density. So, so let me tell you what this map is and see if this helps. <coughs> um, if we think, some people, and I've and I heard Mr. Kirby say this, and I've heard Jim say this, focus on the wrong number, which gets everyone nervous, and I understand. But the reality is, if you're a developer, or you go out and hire an appraiser to look at the property, the big number doesn't matter. What number matters is what's the best return I can get on my property. If I did this scenario over here, you can imagine these lots selling somewhere north of 150, 200,000, probably 150,000. Um, if I was doing a big apartment building, you're not going to get that much money in a big apartment building. So yeah, you could do a huge number with a big apartment building, you could do a huge number with apartment building mm -hmm. under the old zone. Um, that's not what we're seeing. You know, you think about projects we have, think about the really dense projects we had, like on, um, you know, some of the more recent apartments. They're usually two-story town construction. People aren't building elevator buildings. So it's great to talk about big numbers. Now, I understand the Phillips place more than I understand the concern here. Because the reality is that the limits to a project like this are about you want to make the, the profit center is doing one, two, maybe three family, maybe some townhouses. But you're not going to get a big apartment bill. And so you couldn't do it. So we could show a number, it would be sort of a meaningless number. Um, half this project is wetlands and floodplains. So what's more important is what, what's the way it's likely to look at. State hospitals is an example. State hospital by the books could have had a lot more units than it's going on. Um, <coughs> but developers are not building as, as small lots that they're allowed to build. They're not building as little frontage that they're allowed to build because that's not the market of the world. And so we, we're trying to, to figure that out. So that's yeah, by the way, I'm going to prioritize people who express sympathy for me like Jim did. <laughs> <laughs> so if that's you, I think that's your but for now, yeah. I just, uh, you know, given what you just said, um, and then I'll get to my real point, I saw a point up there on the screen. Um, one of the goals or one of the effects that you're anticipating is to reduce the pressure for large scale projects. And I just kind of want to turn that around. This, I want to address the city council members because I remember when this zoning change first was talked about in very vague terms at Ward 3 association meetings. And I remember it being on the horizon. And I remember we all thought, yeah, this is good. This is in infrastructure, infill in the urban area is great. This was going back probably three years. And now <coughs> the situation has considerably changed. You have the vacant Shaw's Motel, which is a huge piece of property. Obviously, everyone would like to see it transformed into something. Um, you have the empty church and the associated building and the parking lot across the street. You know, valuable land should be turned into something. And I really, I think the city as a whole, city councilors need to think about it in big terms of kind of encouraging development in the way that is best for the city and the neighborhoods as a whole. So to have someone knock off a piece of a building to stick two units into a lot 
which three units, which potentially disrupts the neighborhood and the parking situation and everything, versus really encouraging development of existing sites that are sitting there rotting, not welcoming people to town, really an eyesore, you know, that we've had endless meetings about what can we do about this property. It seems to be a conflict in purposes. And that is a change since the zoning laws were, or changes were proposed, and I get that, you know, things are in flux. But given the situation now, you know, is what we really need to do alter dramatically the historic part of the neighborhood or work on the pieces of property that are em empty and really have a policy that encourages developing those sites? And I mean, I don't want a huge megalopolis on the Shaw's Motel, but it looks something. And you know, some policies and laws that really encourage developers to work with the community in ways that benefit the community, not just themselves. I think, I think that's something the city could really work on. So that, that's why I'm hoping we have some special and specific criteria, because that's what these are about. I mean, you know, I, I understand sort of want to talk about existing zoning in the past, but I think it's also really important to talk about what's the zoning before council, and that's sort of the idea of some of these things here. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, the, uh, I'm Adam Quinn from North Street. Uh, we've had this long saga going on with the post condo project in the Packet Woods off of North Street. And um, so a few days ago, I, um, a couple people were in a meeting with our lawyers who have been working on this issue for years, who are very familiar with the 90s law, and we were really struggling to figure out how these new rules might apply to a partial plan like that, which has a lot of wetlands constraints. Um, it's very awkwardly cited relative to people's backyards, um, how it would connect to the existing streetscape. Um, and there was a lot of language in this uh, proposed zoning about, well, we'll do this if it's possible. <coughs> and so our concern was, this, with a parcel like this, developer can say, it's not possible. The planning board say, okay. And, you know, we'd wind up with not really an improvement. Um, and then there's a, a very specific concern, which I'm not sure has been addressed, is um, buffering of things like parking lots from adjacent lots. Um, because essentially the, the abutters are facing the prospect that currently they have a lovely view of mature trees, which would be, you know, it's proposed to be replaced with parking lot, which is very disturbing. Um, you know, four foot vegetative buffer would help a little bit with something like this. So um, those are the, I'd really like to understand and maybe um, additional illustrations about, you know, this is the kind of schematic we want to see and this is the kind of schematic we don't want to see. Um, which would guide the people in the planning board to counsel us to, you know, especially these more difficult sites with a lot of constraints on them. Yeah, I mean, one of the problems with the special permit is it does allow the planning board a lot of discretion to approve projects and not approve projects. It, it, it's a safe, you know, the idea of the standards is sort of to spell out what those guidance things would be, and then, at least currently under state law, it requires a two-thirds majority of the planning board, and the idea is it's a tough standard to meet basically get to sell, you know, a lot of the planning board members if the project makes sense. Um, and so, because each site's different, you know, it's easy when you do a, a standard about a number, you know, we require a building that have a minimum height, we require a building that have a minimum or maximum setback. Those are easy numbers. Some things deal with sites like connectivity in the neighborhood, facades are harder, and so it does have to be more discretion. In terms of the parking piece, I said two answers. Um, one is, I think neighborhoods should always be buffered from parking lots to some extent, so there are standards in the zoning that are not proposed to change of what existing buffer requirements are, and then that is one of the requirements you hear much more in the wrong direction. But, um, so one of the standards um, going all the way back uh, here is looking at parking and buffering requirements. It does two things. It gives planning board some discretion in terms of buffering here. Not so much distance, but sort of how rich. And you can imagine horrible landscaping or great landscaping, that's a big difference. And then also, not so much a monolithic parking lot, but sort of breaking parking lot. Actually, it's parallel parking. But you know, having parallel parking or having parking lots broken up, but not a big monolithic parking lot that's out there. So there's some of that stuff in there, but not so much. Wayne, good example, which you were involved also with my residence on Prescott Road. We have many, many meetings with the builders 
before we even went to plan. And several residents who also live here at City Hall who were abutting this very large development were very pleased to see that we were able to have these meetings being held first before we even went to planning to work it out with the builder on the safety on the roads, um, the buffer, okay, what they wanted for privacy, what type of trees, arborvitaes. It was amazing what we worked out. And we even had a resident, once the surveying was done, found out that she thought this back part of her property was hers, if you can recall that way, and it was not. And Doug Cole had worked out a very good process which made that family happy and they ended up with a back lot in the back. But I'm talking about not one meeting, two meetings, many meetings. And then when we went into the planning board, everybody worked together and they actually had it on the plans of like the Zabrowski's on Pritzford Road with the development in the back. All the residents, you know, there was quite a bit of a butters involved in this. Where we had and what type of trees, where they would have privacy in their backyards, the children, the bus stops. It was amazing what we worked out. One of the, one of the, the questions of the planning board special permit application is have you tried to work, have you met with the neighbors that had time? Um, we can't legally make people do that before they apply for a permit. Mm -hmm. The idea of putting the permit, at least the planning board knows, if it comes before the board and they haven't worked the neighborhood, the planning board's more likely to continue it and say go work with the neighborhood if they have. So at least it's a step, you know. Ultimately, some developers who do a better job of working with neighbors and some who don't do Exactly. Why can't you legally apply? Because we're a creature of state government. And the state says when you apply for a permit, we have to put it on the agenda within 45 days. And if you get it, and we can play all sorts of games with developers and say we're not going to put you on until 45 days until you do. I can't remember who's fixing it, where the time period is. But we can encourage developers and, and incentivize you to go before the board a little sooner. So the city council knows. can't pass an ordinance that says that. We have to. We, we have a zoning enabling act. Can I just have you contest a wonderful example? Um, but if I understand correctly, and perhaps I don't, that's only with large unit development. So yeah. small unit development, like if, if again. Now we did have a small unit, which was off the Dumpy Drive. Okay. Which was, one, two, three, four, five houses. Okay. Okay. So, so and they, we ran into a problem. Yeah. We ran into a serious problem with a difficult developer. Okay. Okay. And we were not going to take that. And he found out what it was like to have an aggressive counselor who would not have their residents being treated that way. So we worked very hard on oh, the issues of safety, the street. I'm hearing great. the same thing yeah. about your street. Yeah. You know, it's like. So, so is this possible? I guess my question is for a three unit. Or say on our street, we end up with, which is, looks like it's going to happen now, um, four three unit properties on what we're small farm lawns. Do we as citizens have a chance to do what you did? Um, because my understanding, I've heard from the building inspector, and maybe I'm wrong, is that we don't have to, they can do whatever they want. Uh, uh, the big thing is, is working with the contractor. And that's what us residents did. Okay, but do we have, a, do we have the ability to do that with a smaller development? So, so the threshold is, <coughs> anytime someone's doing 2,000 square feet of construction, that's for a two family or above, it needs site plan approval. Um, that, that same training, we suggest people to work with developers, with the neighbors. Um, it's on the application form, and all the neighbors get notified. Projects that are below that threshold don't even come before planning, they just come before the building. It sounds like you're describing an kind of informal process on top of that as well. Just right. visual, so neighbor involvement. A lot of additional tool involvement. I just had a couple of comments. Um, I was never dumped on the infill bandwagon uh, like other people. But my, my, my first question is, 
our comment is, I guess I'm not sure why it's the planning department's charge to increase the population uh, in the neighborhoods. I mean, people are leaving New England for Arizona. People are having one kid or two kid, not four kids. Uh, in my case, in my two family, you know, I have a double lot. The kids used to play in the backyard. They invite their neighbors over. So now uh, the yards are going to go away because now I can put two more units on my backyard. And then, of course, because on North Street, we took away the parking along the uh, cemetery, which was the overflow for um, the mm -hmm. funeral home, so there's, and uh, as well as some of the neighborhoods there, so there's less parking. So uh, I agree with him. Uh, you know, I walk actually all the time, but people drive everywhere. Is it reduced? Yes. I understand that instead of 10 trips a day, there's eight. But if there are now 100 more cars, in fact, a 20% reduction on 100 more cars is less trips per car, but you have 80% more traffic. I'm not a math person, so I'm not really <laughs> <laughs> So that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and it doesn't make any sense to me that you are entirely changing the character of the neighborhoods. I understand that some lots were squeezed in. There are houses right next to each other. It's like, how did they build there? All right, I, under the, uh, you know, I understand the old zoning. But uh, under the new zoning, people's backyards, uh, what I'm going to look at is going to be student housing. It's going to be changing the character of the neighborhoods because they can just put a lot of apartments in, smaller apartments, charge less money, less green space, and in fact, the entire neighborhoods in Ward 3, I, I don't know about Ward 4, will change dramatically for what it's been. I mean, you know, North Street and then that part of Ward 3 was the wrong side of the tracks. Now it seems to apparently be the right side of the tracks, um, which is, you know, good, I get that. Um, and I, I guess I just didn't understand if you had answered Adam's question. When I was reading, I didn't bring my glasses, so I can't read it because I can't see. Um, but there was, there seemed to be a lot of, to the extent possible, whenever possible. Um, I look at it as one of the reasons when you were redoing the conservation stuff to within 10 feet is, well, we can't get sued. We, we have to put everything to find so that we don't get sued. Because if we don't actually put what all the rules are, then we're going to get sued. I, I mean, I have issues with that, but I'll let that's over and done with. But whenever you say to the extent possible, I hear, if it is, uh, it's not possible, well, somebody sued. It is possible somebody's going to sue. I don't see how this helps anything by saying to the extent possible. And uh, the other part that I find uh, is the same thing with, with piggybacking on Adam is, why can't you put in buffering that there shall be a four-fifth vegetative buffer uh, at, you know, of shrubbery or whatever that's six feet high so that if people have their cars with their car lights turning in and now it's facing somebody's bedroom window because their driveway is there the way the parking is configured, now you're going to have you know, light issues, noise issues, and all those sorts of things. So I would like to see that um, the ordinance tightened up in such a way that it provides for those things with, as Jim and others have said, Specifics, or at least specific, I mean, I know it's difficult writing regulations, you, you know, uh, but that at least allows for those sorts of things so that when the planning board is looking at the kind of things that you have on the screen, they will actually be able to see is it actually impacting neighbors? How is it impacting neighbors? The neighbors hopefully will show up, or if they don't show up, they can't complain to say, well, my house is here, the driveway or the plan here is going to change, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to have six cars, lights, aimed at my entire den, bedroom, bathroom, living room windows, or those sorts of things. So I would encourage you to, to, um, to try to nail those things down uh, a, a little bit more. I mean, the obvious things are, I, you know, I understand if you're in San Jose, California, and you've got a three-car garage facing the street, and I see these houses myself where, why does the garage seem bigger than the house? Where are the people living, uh, you know, with their stuff? But, you know, those are the obvious things. The things that have to do with quality of life really are, are the things that we've been talking about here. 
and I understand whether our studies, you know, the studies have shown that uh, traffic, you know, but, uh, you know, as this gentleman had said, uh, is it actually study specific to Northampton or in, in who studies it, or is it larger cities of 100, 150, 200,000? I mean, you know, where you're extrapolating the data and saying studies have shown, the data shows uh, across the nation, but, you know, we're a, a city of 30,000, it's been 30,000 people for 100 years. Okay, we've lost 2.6%. Again, I don't know math, I don't know how many people that is. Um, but uh, I guess I'll, I'll stop there. Yes, a question. Don't sure. you have a buffer piece? So that's something we haven't, we have under the special permit criteria, these discretionary criteria the planning board looks at, the buffer's sort of been more part of separate sections on the hazard part of these discussions. Are you thinking this is only for big projects? Or do you think there should be a buffer for all projects? Because it could depend on what we're, we, right. Well, I'm here for the seven units or more. I don't know about the subdivision plans and the <coughs> ten units, but um, I, I'm just thinking about any unit that has seven units or more is going to have, like using this gentleman's, or even uh, four units, uh, unit, but using this gentleman's uh, thing, if there's two people in each of the seven units, that's 14 cars, and then they have people come and visit them, and if you figure they have, you know, well, of course, parking is going to be a problem because where, where are people going to go? But in a seven-unit thing could, in fact, on a consistent and regular basis, have 40 cars coming and going all the time between friends, family, children, visitors, package deliveries, UPS, FedEx. <laughs> Zip car. Zip car. Yeah, I mean, this was the, the Crow Construction condos off of North Street and that parking lot was, I remember talking about it in front of the planning board, basically the citizens begging for some sort of buffer. Um, because there's this huge chunk of parking lot right in front of the lot. They go right, they're right up against the lot lines. Um, and the developer said, I don't want it. It's a tight, the whole thing is a tight fit. I don't want to give up any feet. And the planning board said, okay. So that's that's why we need some real, we're going to get a buffer. He needs to put a a buffer so that the planning board just can't give it away. Um, whether or not the developer really likes it or not. Some, some specificity is, is allowed. In. Right, this this kind of thing is, is not prohibited by it. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing that's about specificity. It's it's sort of the challenge of what are the things that work for all subs. It's harder to predict for some subs. Again, looking at, at what was passed out of this ordinance, it is so vague. You drive a map across to it. All right, and so are you talking about this? I'm talking about the ordinance that was passed. Okay, this has not been passed yet. Just well, say, just that, that is being proposed. Okay. The proposed ordinance, all right, speaking as a lawyer, I look through this, and I, I, don't, I don't claim specialty in land law. I've been practicing with them, but I look at this, it is totally vague that it doesn't really specify anything such as you have to have parking or you have to have a buffer zone. This seems to, aside from the fact that buildings shall meet one of the five criteria, all right, this puts tremendous discretion, all right, up to the planning board, all right, mm -hmm. uh, and it's whatever the planning board thinks is okay. Well, I have an issue with passing an ordinance regulating construction that just invests so much discretion on the planning board. I think the planning board requires some specific guidance, as the gentleman pointed out. All right, don't just talk about there should be, met. there's going to be a buffer, okay? You know, if you want to make a project, it's going to have a buffer, it's going to be, you know, whatever. You have to provide for parking, all right? You have to provide for parking, so for every, you know, number specified, because this is just, it's just broad mission. So let me make sure I present the context for this. So the city has regulations that apply to every project. So for example, the, the thing that Peter mentioned about, you know, that my number is right, you need one parking spot per thousand square feet, that's elsewhere in the zoning. So all the basic rules, that, and, and the same thing about existing buffering, all the basic rules apply to all projects. This is just adding additional criteria for those projects that are overstepping. So absolutely, the basic rules could always have, for example, more buffering, 
and certainly these rules could have more buffering, but don't read these in isolation. So they come out of parking requirements. Clearly that's elsewhere in design. So lots of, this is just like these additional requirements. Yeah, I also think that we can look at this and say, oh, this is a, this is a, um, there's nothing here that's too vague. We could also look at it as more of a canvas. It's unfinished and this is one of the reasons why I have this meeting tonight, so we can decide some of the things that are important. Oh, I forgot to say, I have a great sympathy for you, Ryan. <laughs> All right. You're good, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. R Richard, wait. Yeah, yeah you know, just a question about um, the civic space. I mean, again, it's sort of a suggestion. There's no, there's no metric to it. There's no number. I mean, I'm thinking in terms of you know, of uh, lying in the states. Um, like, how does how does that get hashed out by the planning board? Because they could have a bench and you know, say, here's our civic space. Or someone could say, you have to set aside 10 to 15 percent, you know, of, of this project for that space. I mean, there's going to be, there's obviously going to be a fair amount of open space just given the wetlands around it, but um, but I mean, how is it's it's a good idea, but a soft one. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering how it gets made real. You're absolutely right. And that's one of the challenges, that particularly in an urban area. So we have something called cluster, which is sort of a more of a suburban concept where someone's dividing half the property, putting houses there, and it's a very set number. It's a complicated formula out there. But use the line state as an example. Yeah. If you did a percent, you could easily get the crack nobody else wants. So you have wetlands here and floodplain down yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, developers and give that to us. Yeah. And so we try to do it not as a percent to think about the focal point. So in some ways, you know, our concept obviously developed could be totally different. We think, well, here's a here's a point where all the roads come together. Maybe that's really important as a park, just an example. And that was the only I mean yes one could do a percent. It doesn't necessarily make things better because yeah. you get the leftover way. Un unless you define that space as like the buildable space. And because there's, there's there's a lot on that tract of land that as we sit here, nobody's going to be able to build on. So, I mean, take that away to begin with, and then take your percentage of what's left over. Mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, it's it's 26 acres or whatever, but it's not 26 buildable mm -hmm. acres by any stretch. Right, but you could include it as part of the open space and go yep. up to 50 feet. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I just want to have a slightly <coughs> different uh, request. Um, former president of the Ward Community Neighborhood Association, as you know, we've been working many, many years to get a Pomeroy Terrace Historic District. And it has languished in the planning department, and I understand that there's a lot of things that have to be done. But Sarah La Valley has worked on it for a long time. It just doesn't seem to move from here to Boston where it needs to be approved. We did a tour. There's tremendous support for this all through Ward 3, all through the area that's going to be included in this. Many of our residents worked on it. The time has come to get this project done. And I would like to ask that whatever resources that you need to get the project done and submit it to the state to have it approved, that if you could possibly do it, it would be very much appreciated. People keep asking about it, and it is a high priority for a lot of people in Ward 3. And I mean, we're certainly, we can ask CPA for money, and it's certainly, it's, it, as you said, it's a resource issue. Um, and, or volunteers can do it, obviously, we don't object. Um, yeah, I'd like to congratulate Mary Ann Labarge because we're talking a lot about process. And it seems to me, let's say you're the neighbors and you want to make sure that the neighborhood is like you would like it to be. Okay. So it would seem to me you get a lot more leverage out of working with the builder and trying to get it. In other words, the people in the city government, the various boards and so on, should understand that if they work it out, or at least they'll know what hasn't been worked out, uh, it puts the city in a much better position to make for its decision making. This is a process issue. And so uh, I would recommend we have a, a more structured way of the people. I mean, there's some people who, not in my backyard, that's what all they ever think about. You have to realize there are people out there like that too. And then, but you have to get the people who are reasonable talking to the builders 
and and then the city should say, you really should talk to the local, you know, the people in the neighborhood, because then it makes it much easier for us to go. Otherwise, you can give them a hard time. You can really hold people up. So that should be sort of one of your demands. You must talk to the to the local people first. Okay. Uh, one of the things that makes me anxious about language which expresses a lot of desires, but is still allows lots of looseness is the thing of the sustainable mercantile plan itself, and there's a lot of material in there, and there's things like, you know, there's language expressing desires for more, you know, urban tree canopy. But because there's not really specifics behind that, I, I really don't, I haven't seen the city taking too much action. I know there's some private citizens working on it, but, you know, there's not really implementation like, we are going to plant a thousand trees a year or something like that. And so I'm concerned that, you know, we're going to get a similar thing, a smaller scale with the language that we're seeing here. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I thought this whole thing is the opposite of that. You're filling in the green space. Yeah, filling in the green space. Yeah, filling in the green space. So as, as far as specifics for the ordinance, what I would like to see is if we're, um, if, if we're zoning for urban infill in URC nearest to downtown, that developers are required to build a suburb, a, an urban street that we, we um, that, that it be of a certain width, that it have sidewalks, and that it adhere to the setbacks within URC. And that, um, <coughs> and I think that in terms, that would help developers in terms of laying these properties out. And, and I wanted, I, I'm uncomfortable with the shared streets idea um, that um, I think in terms of uh, people with disabilities, kids being in the street, I think having that curb really helps define things that parents are more comfortable. Um, and that in terms of asking, you know, if, if somebody wants to come in and build at these new densities, that they need to build a street. Instead of a driveway. And call Instead it. of a driveway and call it a street. Can I just ask, um, I'm just wondering if um, when you came to all these conclusions about the need for density in, in certain districts of the city, did you look at other planned communities where there are case studies um, of quality of life versus population density in other cities? Because plenty of other cities have struggled with that. I just wondered if there were any, um, if you did any studying. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there. I think it's the same thing about parking studies. You could find, you know, study examples of great projects, examples of pretty horrible projects that are out there. But we're certainly not alone in what we're doing. We're certainly not leading. So, so were there some great projects that are role models for them? Well, yeah, I, mean, I think lots of, you know, almost any urban, successful urban area you look at, it's, it's wonderful. So there weren't any specifics that you looked at? I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, did, you, did you look at Portland, Oregon? Did you look at, were, were there any role models considered with before and after, you know, just in terms of? You know what's interesting with the challenges in terms of case studies is, is the wonderful case studies we could cite for you that are tending to be more urban. You know, Portland, for example, you know, we, we're doing some things. Portland has 25 foot wide walks. Mm -hmm. um, and they've done a wonderful study. The city actually copied, they did this whole design study of 25 foot wide lots and the design competition. We copied that. We thought it was a great idea, very successful last, last fall, but we do a 50 foot wide box. Um, so we tried to grow from examples in other uh, areas, but we tried to scale them back because we're not a Portland scale. So, I mean, so that Portland Night Light is a good example, but again, we were literally half what they had in terms of, of lot size and less than half what they had in terms of. Their so, size. will we have the, 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 uh, the ability, and maybe you did, of, um, you know, when you were working with specific developers? to share specific ideas of what you would like? I mean, a case study is something that was done elsewhere as neighbors. This came in as a development with so many houses. I think it was, what, 50 something? I think there was some affordable housing also, which we really specified as a neighborhood that there would be affordable housing added in. Um, we knew what type of homes were going in because of the meetings that we were having. The prices were brought up. 
what they would look like. I think there was two, I think there two families, which was affordable. And um, no, there wasn't anything brought up about any other state or anything like that on the development. Doug Cole knew exactly what he was going to do on that property, what the homes were going to look like. And like I said, we were very, very fortunate that we were able to have a very good builder to work with. And I have to say that all the meetings that I had with my residents who were a mother, and even off some of the side streets, he knew that they meant business. They wanted their voices to be heard of what they wanted, what protection they wanted for the back of their yards, the lighting, and so forth. It was excellent. But believe me, Wayne is correct. You can get some contractors, builders, who don't want to listen. And we mm -hmm. did run into that. And we went back into planning and really voiced ourselves about how he treated the neighbors. I said a quick question, actually, for you, Jane, um, which is uh, we've talked about Portland before, and I'm just wondering what what you what you like about it because part of this is we're trying to figure out how we can improve the ordinance. I imagine yeah, you like different things than, than Wayne does, and, but I mean, what is it that I I, I I just bring it up as an example. I'm sure there are many other examples where um, quality of life is very important to residents, and mm -hmm. I would say that's probably the number one mission mm -hmm. for any kind of sustainability plan. That very palpable and obvious in all neighborhoods and Richard, then. Well, I mean, just for Jim's question here, I'll say that, um, I know in the meetings we've had about running in the states, I mean, one of the things we talked about is like, hell, let's find the developer. I mean, why wait for the developer to come to the parcel? And we know the parcel's going to be sold if we have a notion as a neighborhood of what we would like to see there, and some people have some very specific ideas, then one way to approach it is we try to make contact with developers who do the kind of work we would like to see there. Um, and I know there's at least one or two people who are sort of running that down. Uh, I've certainly been taught, you know, for, um, uh, when Opal bought the Brown Hill property, um, there was a neighbor, the proposal that came forward that some people in the neighborhood put together. They ended up not being a low bidder, and frankly, they had more density than Opal had, but they tried to do exactly what it was. Yeah, no, not that, not that the neighborhood wants to be the developer, mm -hmm. but, you know, I mean, this is a pretty astonishing piece of real estate for this town, and there are outfits that, that, and I forget the type of development it's called, but it's, you know, village center and small housing and things of that sort that people are very hip to. That we're trying to find out who those people are. Um, and because, and it's just a different approach. I just want to say that, you know, we're heading up on 8.30, we have about an hour's worth of discussion. I'm happy to go longer, but I also want to release people if they, if they feel awkward about leaving and just have some to go. Yeah, I guess the last time I would think. Can we let we just jump ahead on first and then go to this? Um, there's a perspective I saw from the town in the Midwest, which is very different way to look at all this stuff. And might be, as it pulls together what some people have been saying, it's saying, let's, let's set aside issues of like proximity to downtown and density and all that, and look at a town as areas of change and areas of stability. An area of stability is a, a, an established neighborhood where people basically like it. You know, they feel they have good quality of life. They don't want radical change. It, it concerns them because it could make things worse, so the parking issues and stuff. And then areas of change might be, you know, there's parts of King Street and thinking of the Honda lot and stuff, where it's like, oh, please, change the change. And that... You know, that might be a useful perspective to bring to some of this is, you know, like get another overlay to look at the town as like, I think you're here, and get, you know, Dennis asked, well, you know, I can see why some parties do want, you know, growth and increased commercial activity and, you know, it's issues with money and the town budget and things like that. But for a lot of residents, I mean, that stuff could impact their quality of life. And so, you know, it's important to make those assumptions visible um, because, the areas of stability are kind, of, kind of uncomfortable with rapid change because it's risk for them and, and we don't can't move easily and don't really want to. Um, 
I, I think that sort of unites some of the stuff we've been hearing tonight. That's interesting. Uh, my concern is it seems as though, you know, it's like this is the best we're told. We're told this is the, the meeting for comment, but we have a meeting already planned for the city council to essentially ratify the proposed ordinance. With all of the comments that have been made, um, I think this is something that requires far more consideration. And at a minimum, I would suggest, obviously my ideal would be to repeal the change in this ordinance, but beyond that, definitely the moratorium should be reinstated and some further discussion of some of the issues, some of the putting in specifics, rather than ramming through it at the next week. I am concerned that um, not enough attention has been, hope has been given to the consequences of this. For instance, again, looking at my neighborhood, we moved in in 1986. At that point in time, I don't know about 1986, it was a neighborhood that was transitioning. Older couples were retiring, moving to Florida, dying, and a whole bunch of people, young couples moved in. My wife and I amongst them, and I could see every, just about every house in the street except for the Victoria. Now it's like 30 years later, the neighborhood will start to change over. All right. However, if all of a sudden everything gets filled in on all these apartments, students moving in, will the next generation of occupants be families that provide a certain stability for the neighborhood, or will the neighborhood tip and just simply become a transient place? I can just really quickly say that. Okay. I mean, and I, and I do want to, we can continue the conversation, but I do want to reduce people who want to go. I think in a way you've unwittingly provided kind of a, a good coda if I can selectively take some things out because this is about the future and we do get to decide what this ordinance looks like. The very reason I want to do this forum and Council Chair on this forum is because, you know, it's not being ran through. Um, and there are a lot of some kind of general concerns over today, and there are some specific ideas which might be important. So my hope is to do that. And at the ordinance committee meeting, that's that is part of the process where that can be done. And just to clarify, it's not going to the full council next week. It's going to the meeting. That's true. But I mean, the point's well taken. I mean, this this is about the future, and, and you know, to the extent this is more of a canvas than a cop out. And what, what do we want on the campus? Really, I mean, it's something that we have to decide. And I'm sorry, I guess Adam and then Kevin. Just to tie directly to the point, I'm just thinking about what I've been reading about you know, what's going on in downtown Amherst over the past few years. And my impression is, at least anecdotally from the letters that have been written, is that um, the character of neighborhoods downtown has changed. Um, it's more dominated by students and less, and there's less presence of families. Um, and there was some anguish in Amherst about this change, and there were people who felt it's not, it was imbalanced. And so, you know, I don't know if that's possible here, but perhaps we should consider their experience, they're so close by, and like, you know, what's driving that? Are we going to create conditions where that sort of thing might happen here, and do we want that? Um, you know, it's probably worth a little study. They also plant more trees. Yes, they do. <laughs> so Jane, what's your point of view on that? Who has <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I just wanted to suggest something else, and maybe you considered it, but um, in terms of, the, of density, we're talking about housing, um, and I'm speaking only for myself here, but I'd love to, to have something that we can consider in terms of density that would include more small business, incubation of small business um, in Ward 3, Holly Street, and um, the wonderful things that have been going on on Pleasant Street. Um, I don't know why we couldn't add some something into this for that. We don't only need more housing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a lot of, so, so you rightly enter two districts, or three multiple districts, but, so Holly Street is sort of mixed, part of it's commercial and part of it's residential. Um, but in URC, which is the, a lot of the areas you're talking about, some limited amount of commercial is already allowed, not retail, um, but sort of off, you know, quiet offices type thing are already allowed. So 
not, again, not high traffic doctors can't meet their real estate agents. But um, that's already allowed. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about cars. Uh, it's, it was fascinating to hear the earlier numbers about the shifting between the numbers of people in, in households and the number of cars in households, and it just feels like we're heading more towards this future of more and more cars. And <clears throat> it's hard for me to imagine that if the properties that have been mentioned tonight, uh, the, the larger properties in Ward 3 and 4, um, plus no one's talked about uh, Northampton Lumber with a proposal mm -hmm. for 60 more units and also the Henry Street properties in our neighborhood that have a potential for lots of units. I just see us heading for gridlock in, in downtown Northampton and the hospital hill traffic coming in. Um, our neighborhood in Ward 3 is already a major cut through, you know, from people coming to route, from Route 9 to Route 5 and back and forth. And, uh, even even with Pomeroy Terrace being in the condition it's in, it still goes on. And I'm sure on North Street, now that North Street has been rehabbed. <laughs> you know, there's just cars, and there's it's not just the residents, it's people, it's the residents also, uh, but it's commuters. And, uh, you know, we, we just saw in the Gazette the other day that our air quality yeah. is, is yeah. an F. You know, yeah. um, I mean, I'm, I'm, all, I'm sort of more concerned about the cars than the people and what we're going to do to, uh, and I, I mean, I think that the bike paths we have are fabulous, and I, I credit the, the planning department for all the work that you've done on that, but people are incredibly attached to their cars, and I just, I see that as, as going into a dark future. <laughs> Can I ask a question? How many people walk their bikes here tonight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But that doesn't yeah. mean those of us who drove from Greenfield from work to yeah. get here were bad. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so. It's <laughs> 6 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So, what are you guys doing in the City Hall to ameliorate that problem? I mean, that's a, that's a separate problem that we have today, whether or not there are more houses or not. What are you talking about traffic, independent of how many people? Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't say we cannot build another house, because if we do, it gives me more cars, and that's a traffic problem, and we already have a horrible deal with, deal with traffic. And I, I think that, I mean, I would I suggest that we talk about that separately. Yeah. I, I agree, I'm going to talk about it, but I'm saying that, that that shouldn't be the dominant factor of okay. why we can't put more houses, because we have a traffic problem. Right. Okay. So I'd suggest, is it is pretty much sense of everyone that we ought to adjourn? Is that okay? i got to go home and have dinner. All right. <laughs> you can keep walking over. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter, you had your, I'm sorry, Jane. I, I just wondered, I know you're about to say this, but so what actually have we done? <laughs> we have spoken eloquently about dissatisfaction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, um, like I said in the beginning, I don't don't think that we're going to leave this meeting with an exact game plan. But a lot of ideas we put out on the table through on video. I'm remembering them. Wayne's remembering them. And I think the challenge now is um, to meet um, offline and see what we're willing to change about <laughs> this to start with. And that and that's something we can take into the hearing. We can do that. That's my sense. Okay. That's kind of funny. That was the bang with the whimper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.